Well, we didn't solve everything. <laughs> we can only do so much in 45 minutes. This taxonomy stuff is hard. It'd be really nice if taxonomists in the audience, you could take a holiday for a few years. Let us catch up. Anyway, I'm going now. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so now we come to Arthur's talk. Um, many of you will know Arthur as um, kind of the godfather of data quality, uh, and that's what he's been coming to Tadwig for a few years now to talk about. But he has had a much, much longer association with the organisation than uh, his involvement with working on data quality. And if you have time to read his uh, long biography, usually, oftentimes when you introduce a keynote speaker, you just grab their biography off, off the website and just kind of read that out. But I opened up Arthur's biography and it goes for about six pages. So um, <laughs> I'm not going to read that out because that, that will take the whole hour. Um, so... Uh, so, if you do go and read it, you can see just how extensive his work, research, involvement with standards has been. These days, Arthur spends many months driving around Australia and is a prolific each year and is a prolific contributor to iNaturalist. We were talking at dinner last night and he's contributed roughly more than 60,000 photos representing 20,000 plus observations to our naturalist, which is quite extraordinary. But he tells me that he doesn't go driving over the summer months, partly because it's too hot, but mostly because he has to pick his raspberries. And, um, and I'll be over later to uh, share some of those. So without further ado, um, except that I'm just getting messages on Slack from people online, so I'll just see what they're saying to me, except that's too hard. Uh, so I won't do that. Um, <laughs> uh, ignore them, sorry. David Bloom, uh, you'll have to uh, put up a chat message. Um, so without further ado, Arthur, please come and tell us why it is that we do what we do. Thank you, Ellie, and welcome to all you Tadwegians, um, part of the, the family. And um, I've been around to a few of these, and it's nice to see faces that are regulars and lots of nice new faces that we um, like to see lots more people keep coming. So why do we do what we do? This year is about 50 years since I got my first job as a scientist, although I did work in universities as a technician before that. My dad said to me when I was young, he said, you should leave this world a better place than when you entered it. And I thought that was a good philosophy. But my philosophy has probably been more along the lines of improve the scientific knowledge base so that others following can start at a better place and build on. Now, all the photos I was asked by Ellie, because I did do lots of photos, to add some photos, plenty of photos. My PowerPoint got very large, whoops, um, and I had to compress it all a bit, but I've, all these photos are up on my naturalist and where they were taken is usually shown on there. So when I was in Brazil in the early 2000s, we did some surveys and we found that people became biologists because of backyard bird surveys or their family had taken them on a holiday to the beach and they'd collected shells and they wanted to know what they were or they went butterfly collecting, etc. And now we have lots of phone apps that one there is Frog Watch. Uh, we have, in Australia, we have Fungi Map. We have lots and lots and lots of apps where we can add data in, including into our naturalist. In my story, I grew up on a farm and I thought my dad knew every plant that existed <laughs> and all the animals. And I got interested in that. I started collecting grasses and those are now in various herbaria. Um, 
University of New England in Arbidale, I've got a lot of them, I think. So why did you become a scientist? Why did you become into this field? I know not all of you are biologists or computer people, but why did you get involved? Have you ever thought about it? Was it for the money? Probably not. <laughs> Was it for the kudos? Well, maybe, but doubtful. So I'm sure you all have a, a good reason, and whether you've thought about it or not, I don't know, but it's worth thinking about why you become a scientist, and for many of us, why we've retired many years ago and still keep working. So my life in science basically started off in 1973 for several years at the Australian Academy of Science, which I'll talk about more, then the Australian Biological Resources Study, the Environmental Resources Information Network, commonly called ERIN. Uh, then I worked in CREA in Brazil, the Reference Centre for Environmental Information. And then I did lots of international consultancies. Now, I'm supposedly retired. I don't know really whether that happens, but I do a lot of work with Tadwick and iNaturalist, etc. So in 1970, uh, on the bicentenary of Captain Cook's visit to Australia, um, Professor William Stern from the British Museum of Natural History, and he spent a lot of time at Kew as well, came out and he delivered a lecture on the need for a new flora of Australia. Now, Sir Morris Morby, a fellow of the Academy, he was head of the Consig Rio Tinta, the big... Um, aluminium company at the time, offered startup funding. So a lot of discussion followed about how we could use this fair bit of money, but really small in the terms of doing a floor of Australia, how we could develop that and what we could do as a precursor to the new floor of Australia. And they decided an index to all the plant names. The project started under the auspices of the Academy of Science, housed at the herbarium at CSIRO, which was in the middle of what's now Black Mountain Road, and it came down, and Nancy Burbage refused to move the building until they had a new one, so the road came down and went round like that. <laughs> and my office looked at all these trucks coming straight down the highway towards me. Uh, Dr Nancy Burbage, a very well-known Australian botanist and a lovely person, was appointed to lead the project. Dr. Hans-Jörg Eichler, a German who never learned his, lost his real strong German accent, <laughs> um, but was an, he was a, a lead advisor and, and certainly a mentor to me on the nomenclatural side of, of plant taxonomy. And Nancy Burbage fell ill a few years after the start of the project and, and I took over the running of it. It was then when the money ran out, two and a half years of funding, the money ran out and was taken over by CSIRO and at about the same time the Bureau of Flora and Fauna had started, which later became OBRS, and in 1980 it was incorporated into the Department of the Environment. Now the Australian Plant Name Index, which was some 17 years of my life, along with other things, but um, was published in 1991 in four volumes, 64,000 names, four volumes of 3,056 pages. I visited 149 libraries around the world. I spent quite a bit of time in, at Kew Gardens, uh, the British Museum of Natural History, and then all around Europe, travelling around every city in Europe. I used to travel by train to the next city on Friday, walk around the city for miles on Saturday and Sunday, work from Monday to Thursday, and then travel to the next city. What a life. <laughs> um, the, we recorded the name, the author, the publication, the type citation, the basianim, the, the um, junior synonym if you're a zoologist, um, how the name was treated in recent publications. It was an index to names. It wasn't an index to taxa, but we reported how other people uh, used those names 
so uh, in taxa. So we reported others' taxonomy, but it was an index to names only. Uh, and then various comments on the nomenclatural status. Uh, and this was a forerunner of the International Plant Names Index, IPNI. At the time of publication in 1991, it was the largest publication by a single author written in, and published in Australia. It was shortly taken over by uh, some volumes on weevils published by CSIRO. <laughs> so in those days, we didn't have all these laptops, mobile phones running around. These fancy projectors and computers and we did it all on eight by five filing cards. And then eventually we had to um, scan them in to uh, get them typed into the computers. And with fixed keyboards at that time, a lot of repetitive strain injuries and that sort of thing was a problem. So I've got the specification of our first computer. And it said it had to have at least 16,000 characters of accessible memory. Now we're talking about big data this morning. This is big data. <laughs> a printer which would output in both upper and lower case. That was very important. <laughs> it had to have an online storage of approximately 500,000 characters about 2,000 core data records and an, off, and an indefinite amount of offline storage. The computer that was decided on was a DEC 78. If you go to the DEC Museum in Boston, you go into the foyer and there's one right there, <laughs> right in the front. So fixed keyboard, terrible things to use, a video data processor with a VDU screen and keyboard attached, Dual disket, dual disket drive. So one was for the operating system and one was for the data. Eight-inch floppies. Now, probably you've never, most of you may never have seen one. Eight-inch floppy disks. Um, and we had two operating systems, one for word processing and um, one for programs which were basic and Fortran 4. So some of the challenges in doing a plant name index. Um, one was finding the protologues of every name published for plants in Australia. There were four I didn't find. <laughs> they still drive me nuts. But one was, <laughs> one I took oh, a lot of searching for, was published by a nursery in France, in Paris. That nursery went out of business a long, long time ago and I couldn't find a copy of that uh, catalogue in any library anywhere. And one of the other ones, I travelled around all the herbaria and, and every one, or the botanic gardens, and they all had seed catalogues. They produced seed catalogues, and often there was a description in there. And they all had a copy of the Palermo catalogue. So I thought, oh, well, I'll go down to Palermo. So I hopped in the train and stopped in Florence and Rome and Naples and did work on all those. Got down to Palermo and went to the gardens. They said, oh, we didn't think anybody would be interested in those. We burnt them all two weeks ago. <laughs> <coughs> so I got to try some different grappers after that because I had a week with nothing to do. <coughs> um, digitising all this data was a big job, typing all those cards in. And editing was huge. We didn't have relational databases, so editing all this was not easy. So at one stage, the department bought an AWA SQL database, which would only do sequential searching. So in the evening, after everybody went home, I'd start six computers up and do these sequential searches. <coughs> trying to look for errors. And then at 11 o'clock at night, one night, I get a phone call from HR. Hey, can you come in and turn all your computers off? We can't pay the staff because you're using up all the CPU. <laughs> so 
another problem. Uh, the size and, and publishing it was pretty awkward. Greg Whitbread, who's in the audience, did a lot of the programming for the typesetting of this. And if you know dictionaries, they have the first word on the page and the last word on the page. Well, that was okay, but then changing from one volume to the next, it all went crazy. The only trouble is Greg had gone on holidays <laughs> and I'm trying to wade through Greg's C plus programming and not an easy thing to do. Greg comments out lots of stuff, but it's not really clear. So I'm wading through this to try and find the, the error in this running headings. But we finally got it done. And uh, then many years later, it was published online by the Australian National Botanic Garden and Greg, along with Jim Croft and others, did a lot of work on getting that. And it's now available online. Now, some other things we were doing at the time. One was developing an early data interchange standard. Darwin Core, before Darwin Core, there's a copy if anybody wants to look at it. The Australian Biotaxonomic Information System Data Interchange Standards. Now, that's 1979. If you look through it, you've got basis of record and lats and longs, all 80 characters or field maximum 80 characters. And um, there's no internet to do your transfers in those days. The data will be recorded on half-inch wide magnetic tape in nine tracks at a density of 32 rows per millimetre, et cetera, et cetera, following certain standards. So all the data had to be transferred on magnetic tapes. That's around for people to look at if they want to afterwards. But that's Darwin Core 20 years before Darwin Core. And after that became HISPID, the Herbarium Interchange uh, Interchange uh, Internet standards, I think it was, for the uh, and protocols for the interchange of data. That HISPID was supposed to be an interchange standard, but very few people ever used it as an interchange standard. It was used for people to design their databases. So a lot of the herbaria and even some of the museums used that to design their databases. Also working for the Australian Biological Resources at the time was the, we were writing the floor of Australia. Um, and volume one, which was launched at the International Botanical Congress in Sydney in 1981, it was typeset on a Cyber 76 mainframe computer in CSIRO. No WYSIWYG, no looking at the screen to see where the errors. We had to get a printout line by line. And at one stage, we globally changed some word. We said, oh, we'll change, change this. Some hair term like HISPID or something to something else. So we globally changed this and then we're printing it out and realised that that sequence of letters that formed that word did appear in some other word somewhere. So... We had to go carefully through line by line and find all these to produce the first volume of the Floor of Australia. The other interesting thing with ABRS was it had targeted funding. So instead of um, normal grants, we worked out what parts of the flora could be published in periods ahead, in five years and ten years, and funding was targeted to those families so that we could get the, the whole families published in a sequence. And we also did some work on atlas series with using some modelling. So we had the atlas of a lapid snakes and those interested in bioclim. That's where the bioclim uh, papers were originally published. And then I moved to Erin. Environmental Resources Information Network. And several people said, no, you won't do that. You're, you're a taxonomist. You can't go into GIS and things like that. You don't know anything about it. You'll never learn it. So that was a challenge. Um, so we set up Erin, and I'll explain how it came about in a little while. But we had GISs, ESRI and ARCINFO, 
uh, Oracle database management system, a knowledge-based system using hypertext. Um, we modelled using BioPlim, Blim, GARP, etc. I mentioned that. Um, and we took remote sensing from space on a fortnightly basis and averaged it all and we produced the NDVI for the whole of Australia every fortnight. And when the internet, the World Wide Web came, we were putting that out on the World Wide Web. And we had a, a brilliant fellow uh, who learnt, did a lot of the work on removing cloud and we went over to the Sioux Falls, uh, the US um, data centre in Sioux Falls and taught them how to do it, thinking that we had one person doing it, they had 40 people doing it, and that we'd get some brownie points and that way. Um, and I'll mention uh, in a minute the environmental decision support system, and we all worked on Unix workstations. Erin came about because... It was the time that we were looking at forestry conservation in Australia and the ministers, the Department of the Environment put forward all this information and maps. The Agricultural Department put up all these maps and things and the ministers poured over maps till 4am in the morning trying to work this out. And they said, we don't want to do this anymore make sure you all get the facts right and then we can make the political decision. But we're arguing over facts between different government departments. So they established uh, Bob Hawke, the Prime Minister, in a report on our country, our future, established the Environmental Resources Information Network and at the same time a similar organisation in the agricultural area called the National Re Resources Information Centre. We were targeted to have the same computing systems, the same software, and be able to interchange all the data so that we could, the departments could up, put up different political views, but we we're all based on the same data. Erin was started with initial funding of 1.8 million and then 2 million each following year. Now, Erin took on a lot of continent wide databases. It's if you work with ALA now, you'll see a lot of similarities here. So the Australian Plant Name Index, the Census of Australian Plants, the Vertebrate Species, the National Wilderness Inventory, World Heritage, a big um, metadata system called FINDAR, uh, land cover, indicator species, bioregions, etc. And then we had some regional work, for example, in Cape York Peninsula. The land cover project. Now, not many of the botanists realise how their digitising came about in Australia. But we developed a land cover project of key land cover taxa, eucalypts, acacias, grasses, uh, chenopods, um, casuarinas, etc. Those that form the major, the key drivers of the landscape. And we funded the databasing of the herbaria to start off. We also put funding into the museums, but most of it went into the herbaria to database all those taxa across the whole of Australia. Uh, we put up $700,000 in the first year and nearly $1 million in three years. And we did it by contract. Now, nobody knew what contracts were. And the other thing I built in the contracts in 1989, 1990, but the, all the data was to be freely available on the internet. Now, not many herbaria at that stage even heard of the internet and knew what it was, but they signed the contract. My name was mud later when I released some of the data on the internet. And I said, what are you doing? I said, sorry, I'll look at your contract. <laughs> um, all the data was georeferenced with uncertainty um, and precision, followed custodian Ship principles, so anybody making the data available, you, know, you, you reference back to them whose data it was, and it followed the HISPID standard wherever possible, and it was a catalyst to for later work. And in a report by James Armstrong uh, on funding for Australia's biological resource, uh, collections, 
It was said clearly the Erin Grants have succeeded in encouraging Herbaria to allocate more of their own resources to the data paging task. So that's what kicked off. Before that, people were databasing records, but they were databasing their own little research collection. There wasn't a, an attempt to database large collections. And so here we see that the, the 12 institutions, I think, and the number of records that were databased and the various taxa that were done with um, Eucalypts and Poaceae and et cetera, et cetera. In doing that, I suddenly realised, oh, we've got a sudden, we've got a million records. What are we going to do with this? Can't check them all individually. And the Herbaria weren't used to doing this because yeah, they, they did the data quality, but they were only dealing with a few hundred records often, not a million. So, um, and a lot of them said, why are we doing lats and longs? Nobody's using that. It's, they're only for taxonomy. Why do we want lats and longs on them? So, it was fun games. But So, I developed some data quality checking algorithms and using the reverse jackknife was one that some people use here. Uh, and report, uh, made reports back to the custodians. So reverse jackknifing works like this. This is 19 records of, a, of an acacia, and you can see the one in, uh, and this is using climate parameters, nine temperature parameters. Um, and you can see that one is not fitting the pattern there. The, these are temperature of the coolest quarter, temperature of the wettest quarter, and all those sorts of things. So um, reverse jackknifing takes the distance between one record and its nearest neighbour, multiplies it by the distance between that record and the mean, and then divides by the standard deviation. There was no statistical method for identifying an unknown number of outliers at both the top and bottom of bottom of an array. There are plenty for identifying them at the bottom of the array or the top of the array, um, but not both. So there's a whole lot and there's publications on this that I put out. So we end up with, with this, we divide by the standard deviation. And jackknifing, if you know about jackknifing, it, it tries to reduce the effects of outliers. I'm trying to produce, increase the effects of outliers to find these records. But because the C value right relates to its nearest point, if there are two blue records close together, then it would identify them both the way that we, we set it up. Because, um, and in some very rare species where you didn't have a lot of records and they occurred on the t one side of the other of a summer winter rainfall line, you could get 100% because they're sort of crossing each other. So that was a pr problem and um, there's a lot of work going on more recently, I should publish that up, is um, looking at what actual layers, environmental layers you use because not all are suitable. So uh, a few of us at a spinach meeting in Albuquerque many, many years ago, uh, Develop this system of outlierness. How, to what degree was a an outlier an outlier? Um, so we put um, this curve, um, which is I don't know of any mathematical expression for that curve. It's a trial and error, but it's basically the number of records. You added this plus point two to bring it off the at the, the bottom a bit, but that's that's the, the formula. Uh, the N is the number of records and the C from the previous one, and if it's above the, the line, it's an outlier. If it's below the line, it's not an outlier, and the distance above the, out, the line will give you the degree to which an outlier. This is all built into the GIS software, Diva GIS, um, if anybody wants to play with it. Um, another thing we did with a lot of the data that we brought in was develop a regionalisation for Australia. So we now had lots of data that we could start playing with and we could start modelling. 
So we did these um, bioregionalizations and then we had to get agreement between states because some of the states didn't like the way the boundaries fitted. So there was a lot of discussion on, on changing it a little bit to fit what the locals wanted. Um, used for regional and national planning, biogeographic studies, and then later we did a, a marine one as well. And that's used pretty universally across Australia now. Um, oh, this was a beautiful little dingo when I was camping on the Streslecky Desert. He just came and watched me all the time. It's, it's so healthy too. It was amazing. Um, so the internet. 1989, Rnet was established in Australia, Australia-wide by 1990. Um, and in 1991, Gopher. Now, Gopher was the precursor of the World Wide Web, um, but it didn't have any uh, images or things like that. It was all text-based. So if you wanted to draw a map, you use backslashes and dashes and all that sort of things. So it provided a free text search mechanism across multiple collections of textual data. Uh, in 1992, a thing called WACE, Wide Area Information System uh, Service, was developed and that allowed good online searching of uh, Gopher. Now, Aaron adopted Gopher and WACE early on in 1991-92 and we started doing modelling on there. Um, using GARP and Bioclim modelling, and we were modelling species distributions and drawing these maps and models and everything using X's and dashes and stuff like that. And then the World Wide Web came about. This was great. Now, in 1992, uh, 93, David Green, who later became a director of Erin, um, he set up his bioinformatics site at uh, life.anu.edu.au. Um, shortly after, Jim Croft and Greg Whitbread, who's in the audience somewhere here, um, set up a new worldwide server for biodiversity information, the third one in Australia, and I think about the 11th in the world. And shortly after, August of 1993, Aaron set theirs up and we were the fourth or fifth in Australia. And they're all within the first 150 worldwide websites in the world. And by November 1993, there were 209 worldwide web servers and six in Australia, 95 in Europe, 100 in North America, eight in Asia and elsewhere, and six private ones. So we got in very early. We took a, a gamble. We said, this is the future. Um, a lot of people said, no, 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 it's too dangerous. You know, people can pull all the data and pinch it all. And, um, I was on a plane with somebody from the US State Department about five years after this and said, oh, no, no, we've got one machine. It's in a room of its own. It's got lead lined, and that's the only one that will link to the, the um, internet. <laughs> So there's some references there when people can read them on when they pull it down, gives you the history of the World Wide Web in Australia. So this was one of our very first web sites. The Aaron Web and Gopher Service drew praise from the University of California, Berkeley, as early as the 30th of August 1993. Uh, registration was CERN. We registered it was in 15th of October 1993 and it started very quickly. It overran the, the hits for Gopher as people got onto it. And a large part of the hits was because of our modelling using GARP and Bioclim. So we started modelling on the internet using Gopher and then the World Wide Web using two modelling softwares, Bioclim and GARP, the Genetic Algorithm for Rural Production. Now, I've, again, one of the things I funded was Dave Stockwell to develop GARP. 
and uh, he worked with us in Aaron to do that. And we presented a paper on what we were doing at the second Worldwide Web Conference in Chicago. And that's the same conference that Tim Berners-Lee gave his URL paper. So that's how quick we were jumping into this. But modelling was pretty coarse at that stage. I think it was uh, half a degree modelling. So for some international collaboration, um, we started trying to share these technologies and share this information with people. And we began a thing called BIN 21, Biodiversity Information Network 21, where um, people from Canabio, Jorge Sobral, people from Inbio, people from, um, I think I might have another slide, but uh, Finland, um, a couple of others, we got together to agree to share our technologies and information and everything. It's a long story, I don't want to go into that. But Smithsonian Institute. Um, Tom Lovejoy visited my office early on, see what you guys are doing. And I started showing him some stuff and there's some data from the Smithsonian. He said, where did you get that data? When did we give you that? I said, Tom, that's live. I'm pulling it off your system. <laughs> I said, wow. <laughs> I've got to go back and see my staff. And so he went back and said, oh, this is great. This is fantastic. We've got to put more money into this, which was great for them. Shortly afterwards, I went to the Smithsonian and I gave a talk. And two days later, Ross Kelly, our Minister for the Environment, visited the Smithsonian. And Tom's saying, oh, you've got this fantastic organisation in Australia doing brilliant work. So she came back and said, oh, we've got to fund you people better. So <laughs> little catalyst, <laughs> playing under the table a little bit and getting things happening. Whoops, I've lost the slide. Um, Berkeley, I, in those early days, I went to Berkeley and I gave one of the first ever video conferences at Berkeley. Um, I had told not to move my hands fast because everything was slow <laughs> and uh, then the, it was those big overhead transparencies used for the projecting at those stages and one projector, one camera failed and, and anyway shortly after that as soon as I finished I got a call from the um, government in Sacramento don't move we've sent a car down to pick you up I went back to Sacramento and talked to them. They were developing their big database system for the whole of California, all their land and everything else. And yeah, this is great. And three weeks later, they brought John Busby, my colleague, over to California to talk to the Californian Senate on how to set that up. So a lot of what we talked to them then has become the big database system for the state of California at the moment. Dan Jansen, I don't know how many of you know Dan Jansen. Back in before the internet, Dan was known for getting a bright idea, faxing it to 200 people <laughs> and driving everybody crazy. But then the internet came along, so it was not 200 people, it was 2,000 people with these bright ideas. But Dan Jansen brought a, a team down to Australia um, Got some funding from USAID, brought people from Mexico, oh, from, yeah, Mexico, Costa Rica, Indonesia, Kenya, to Australia, and some other people paid their own way. Stan Bloom was one that came from the US, and there were some people from the Natural History Museum. And some people say that that meeting was the start of biodiversity informatics, but they speed up two weeks pulling down all our systems, how it worked and everything else to try and go back. And Dan had come out and said, right, I'm going to have meetings every day. We'll work with them every day. And then at night we're having meetings to discuss what we did. And I said, Dan, you're in Australia. We're going out for a beer. <laughs> anyway, when he got back, Winnie, his wife, he said to me, Dan has never slept on a plane, but he slept the whole way back. <laughs> You worry about completely. 
So we were involved, the BIN 21 group were actually involved in trying to develop a clearinghouse mechanism for the Biodiversity Convention. They wanted it all centralised and we argued strongly, a whole lot of us, for a distributed system. They never published the results of that meeting because they didn't like what we were doing, but that's what it was. Um, we did a lot of work with CoData. I was on the FAPESPI, the, the funding body for the state of Sao Paulo for, for PESPI Biota. For PESPI gets uh, one and a half percent of the state of Sao Paulo, their budget is written into the constitution, goes to science. It's not touched by politicians or anything. And they have a big amount of money now and they just, basically all the research money comes from the interest. So I was on the, or helping set up the biodiversity part of that. And then for 13 years, I was on the, um, the steering committee. Well, there you are. Stan, there's Barry Chernoff. <laughs> and uh, Peter Shaw, some of you know Peter from Holland. So every year I'd go and they'd bring in two other experts from somewhere around the world, not necessarily biodiversity people, they were social scientists or chemists, etc. So we'd meet, a photo there of myself with Jim Croft at Jalapa, one of Tadwick's early meetings, one of the best meetings of all. Uh, there's a few people here at that. I think Walter Berenson was one. That's where we, that meeting we changed from paper-based standards to starting to get into IT and technical stuff. So, yeah, the BIN 21 involved Korea, which was based at Ados Tropical at the time and became the Centro Referencia de Información de Ambiental. Erin, India and Costa Rica, Canabia in Mexico, Finbin in Finland, Biobanco in Ecuador. And we met, it was fun going to those meetings. The meetings were fluently going from Portuguese, Spanish, English, backwards and forwards, just seamlessly. It was quite amazing. So one of the things we did was take up species distribution modelling. Now, an American asked me why we relied so heavily on species distribution modelling. And uh, I said, well, all of Australia's population is around the coast, or most of it. I said, what do you do if you see some remote sensing issue? So we send one of our 21,000 field officers out to have a look. I said, well, if I find one out in the middle of the desert, it might be take me three weeks to get there. Um, you know, have to take a helicopter and drop fuel along the way and all sorts of things. So I said, we rely a lot on modelling. And this was early the land cover project. You can see where the collections were based around... Um, population centres. and So we started modelling. This other was a project in Cape York Peninsula where we used modelling to look at collecting effort. Now, you can look at one of those areas that looks well collected, but we looked at climate areas and we'd find that even though it looked geographically well collected, climatically it wasn't well collected. So we had a helicopter up there while we were doing this and they were flying to all the places we identified to do extra collecting. So then we went into climate change, etc. So in modelling we used a whole lot of models, Biotin, GARP, GLIM, GAM, neural networks, decision trees, etc. and later Maxent when it became available. This old elephant from the Okavanga Delta I was with a, a guide in an outrigger canoe, an old local canoe, going up the Okavanga Delta, and we came back, and this fellow was in the canal, and he wasn't going to move. It took us three hours to get around him after ending up finding some, going and finding some campers with some matches and setting fire to the grass on the side. He goes off like machine guns and eventually got out. He wasn't happy. Um, then some climate change studies. I wrote two big reports for the government on climate change and the effects on um, 
biodiversity. One was on threatened species, the other was on major landscape taxa and types like Mitchell grass and some of those. Um, one of the things that 1997, we wrote a paper and we made predictions for 2023, 25 years ahead. That was our prediction chart. Um, we used a conservative climate change, one degree, and we predicted a whole lot of things. Now, everything we predicted for 2023 had come about by 2018. So we predicted increased rainfall events at greater, oops, at greater intervals, um, which leads to flooding and increased uh, evaporation, increased water runoff because the dry, your plants die off and then you get heavy rainfall events, uh, longer dry spells with droughts, bushfires, increased wind erosion, fewer frost. We weren't sure of cyclone frequency intensity um, or the changes to El Nino, La Nina. Um, but as we all know, cyclone frequency has probably dropped, but the intensities have increased. We've got a lot more four and five category cyclones now. And this is the sort of thing we did. We used Bioclim. Uh, the first one there is, this is a Kawari. Uh, so the first scenario is in control, current situation, well then, the second one was a small temperature increase and no rainfall increase. The third one was a large temperature increase, a small increase in rainfall. And the fourth was a large temperature increase with a large increase in rainfall. Now the Kawari is a small little marsupial there, beautiful little animal, and he digs burrows in the sand. Now if you look at the predicted areas under these, there's no sand in that area, that's all rocky country. So we predicted that it could well go extinct. Now they're introducing that species into other areas um, and hoping that it will survive. But we did that for a whole lot of threatened species, plants and animals, and published that. I've got to scan it in because I can't find original copies anymore because it was a, a report to the government. And then we started decision support um, tools. Uh, we hadn't used it. We still don't in biodiversity much now, but um, the Bi Environment Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act came along and we, um, I won't go into that, but there's significant penalties if somebody puts a development in and destroys a matter of environmental significance or national significance. So we, it covers world heritage properties, Ramsar wetlands, threatened species and communities, migratory species, Commonwealth marine area and nuclear actions and additional things by regulation. Now, we concentrated on threatened species and communities and migratory species. So we modelled all of those. We collected all the data, even though the Western Australian government wouldn't give us any data at the time. We tried to work out where the points were using publications and all sorts of other stuff. And a few people did slip us some data under the table. Um, so we modelled 3,500 species um, using bioclim um, and migratory species. And then we took them to the experts and they modified it saying, oh, this specimen can't be right and it only occurs on serpentinite soil, so... Uh, change your model so it's restricted to the serpentinite soils and things like that. So underneath the 3,000 models. This still works today. So and it's been up to date. And one of the things was if a developer came and built something and they didn't check the species, etc., cetera, that were there, they could be fined millions of dollars. Um, so because these models are being updated all the time, we had to have a very strict change system so that you could go back at any point in time and say, what was it What was it giving me at that time? So it's available for the minister, for the NGOs, for environmentalists, developers. They all use the same data, the same tool, and pull out the data and see what's there. And, oh, sorry. 
the back. Um, so you can draw your circle where your development is and pull out information. And this is the sort of info. Whoops. That's great. I wonder how they did that. <laughs> um, so it'll tell you in that area the, whether there's World Heritage properties, natural, National Heritage places, wetland Ramsar sites. Um, there are 39 listed threatened species and there's four listed migratory species. Now, it might say um, species or species habitat likely to occur in the area, or this one may be. So it depends on the levels of the modelling, etc. <clears throat> the minister wanted to know exactly does it occur there or does it not occur there? And I tried to do some research, didn't work out, but looking at time distance decay, looking at each specimen, each record, and saying, the further distance you are from that, there's less likelihood. The further, the longer time since it was last collected, less likelihood. But with threatened species, there are just too few data points to really get a robust system. Still publish the results, though. Um, we won some big awards for some of our work. In 1993, we won the Computer World Smithsonian Award for innovation in technology to the benefit of mankind. And in 1993-2000, we won Australian Government in Technology Awards. Dave Watts was in the audience. The year we won, the 2001, we got the Gold Award and they, the, the Antarctic Data Centre won the Silver Award. So we did really well in that year. Okay, yeah, I'll move through that. Um, after I left that, then it was to Korea in Brazil and Vandalay Canos said, oh, you're retiring. Can you start next week in Brazil? And Dora, his wife, said, oh, at least give him a couple of weeks to put his dressing gown and slippers on. <laughs> so I went down there and we worked on data quality and niche modelling and symbiota and all sorts of stuff. And, and a lot of that has come into the other bit. A whole lot of us worked on Biogeomancer. Um, which was a bit like our GeoPic thing, a bit more advanced uh, in three languages, English, Portuguese and Spanish. Uh, the problem was it was funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and National Science Foundation and all the funding ran out about six months too early for us and the storage of this was a big problem and... John's been hopeful of restarting it, but I think we're now putting our work into GeoPic instead. I published a paper. This is my most cited publication. It's also the most cited by ABRS and ALA, etc. Number of species, living species in Australia and the world. This is the second version. I even got a nice little letter from David Attenborough thanking me for this publication. Um, so I've come up with 11,300,000 species. Now, you get people varying it, but not many people have criticised this because I went to every people in all the taxonomic groups to get the information. Now, I've just been told, in fact, I had an email message last night that they're doing a third edition at ABRS and they were wanting to know if I'd had any feedback that I could supply them. And then I did lots of publications for GBIF. Data quality, methods of data cleaning, species codes, etc. And the last one that we did here, John Jorick and I, on Guide to Best Practices for Georef or Georeferencing Best Practices is the latest one, and the Quick Reference Guide. That's published on GitHub using ASCII docs, so it's a living document. It can be updated at any time and it's being translated by crowdsourcing into um, Spanish and French, I think, at the moment. Some of these publications have been translated, some of them in English, French, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, Portuguese and Japanese, and some of my training manuals in Russian. Uh, Georeferencing best practices. Um, there I have people all using it. It will be updated. I, John and I have got to update it in the next couple of months for dynamic datums. 
Australia's introduced a dynamic datum because since WGS 84, Australia has moved 1.7 metres and it's continuing to move. So we've introduced GDA 2020, uh, which is a dynamic datum and it's actually being implemented this month. The dynamic part of it, the GDA 2020 has been around a little while. Um, the Atlas of Living Australia, I've had a little bit of feedback from them and you can go in, this is the thing I like, I've talked to several people here about the annotations. So I go in and say, look, this record, um, the latitude and longitude's wrong and this is what it should be. And they went in there and I didn't hear anything for two years or something. In the last fortnight, I've had 128 responses. The Victorian Herbarium and the New South Wales Herbarium have been going along and checking all these and... and, and you can see that they always make a, an annotation. You don't delete the annotation when you fix it, you make a comment on it. So, you know, thanks Arthur, Arthur changes reflected in the ALA, etc. So, some of them are taxonomic, some of them are uh, geographic. So that's great. Um, one of the big projects I was working on was the World Bank project on crop wild relatives. Uh, it was called in situ conservation of crop wild relatives through enhanced information management and field application, working in Bolivia, Sri Lanka, Madagascar, Uzbekistan, and Armenia. And I trained everybody, as well as being technical advisor, I trained everybody in uh, data management, data quality, uh, bioclim modeling, maxent modeling, and reserve selection methodology so that they could work on that. That was a great project, I loved it. Um, so that's the sort of thing. Uh, produced lots of training manuals in Sp French, Spanish, Russian and traditional Chinese. Various other World Bank projects on rapid assessment, um, capacity development, etc. pollination. And then this meeting we've released GeoPIC. Uh, we look for feedback on that. This is a georeferencing, little georeferencing um, software. It's uh, available at geopic.gbif.org. We thank GBIF for hosting this. And this is the first version. There will be lots of other versions. If somebody wants to give us some money, particularly, there'll be lots of versions. <laughs> and Tadwick. This is my 19th Tadwick. Um, so I've got to go to Okinawa to make it 20. Um, I've worked various data, qual uh, data uh, standards, but particularly the Data Quality Interest Group, of which I'm a uh, convener, and we're very close. We've pushed out one big publication there, and we're very close to having a standard, and by next Tadwick, we hope to have BDQ Core up and available and people using it. Um, this is the sort of thing you can go into GitHub and find all the stuff and it should be easy to implement in your own databases. And then I travel around the nine naturalist. So about 55,000 photos, 19,500 observations, a lot sitting in my database to do. And you can see all the dots of where I've been and I've covered Australia fairly well. And it's, it's interesting, uh, more plants than anything else. But. So where to from here? Now, a lot of you in the audience are starting to get involved in AI. I know a lot of people are really scared about AI. There's a couple of really good shows on television that you can start to get scared about this. <laughs> but I lived through the development of computers, mobile phones, and everybody else was scared at the same time. Um, we just have to be careful of how we use this. Use it with care um, and I'm a bit envious of some of these young people in the audience who will be working with this. I can think of so many applications and some I've heard here and I'd just love to be involved but I'm sure I won't have enough time. So that's it. Thank you. And a beautiful sunset.
and a beautiful sunset at Hangaroa on Rapa Nui, or as most of you know, Easter Island. Thank you so much, Arthur. That was uh, so. Now you can see why Arthur's uh, bio goes for six pages, as previously. <laughs> Now, I know people will be needing to start to leave to get out to the airport, so if you do need to head off, then thank you very much for coming, safe travels, and we'll see you next year, hopefully. If you don't have to head off and have a question for Arthur, we'll just take a couple of questions before completely closing the session. Sorry about the time. Counter here was stuck on 14 minutes 58 the whole time. So. <laughs> 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 Anyone, any questions? Oh, we've got one. No, no. Thank you very much, Arthur. That was wonderful. It's Nicole from BHL Australia and it's more of an offer than a question. Um, we have worked with ABRS over the last couple of years to get a lot of your early publications up onto the Biodiversity Heritage Library to make them accessible for everyone. But I realise looking at your talk, there are quite a number that we're missing, not necessarily your ABRS ones, but others. If you have personal copies in your collection that you could put online, you could send them to me and we will drop everything, digitise them and get online because I think it's invaluable that those are made publicly accessible and easily discoverable. I've also got another book that I'm going to give to the National Library. In 1909-1910, a botanist by the name of um, Carl Damin and a geologist by the name of um, Yuri Danash, two Czechs, travelled around Australia. They wrote some books called From Java to Java, Projin Java to Java. Um, they're in old Czech. I've been gradually translating them. I had a friend translate parts. I'm gradually translating it using Google Translate and then having to work out what they're actually saying. But great information about um, Aboriginal history, the plants, the vegetation and everything. And I'd just like to make that available somewhat. I was hoping that I was going to take it to the National Library and see if they'd scan it in. And... Uh, Okay. <laughs> two, two big volumes. For those online, Nicole from BHL just offered to do that scanning for tomorrow instead of taking it to the National Library, <laughs> even though it's a Saturday. Okay, I don't see any other hands. Um, Arthur, I'm just going to come up and join you up here um, so that people online can see us. Um, I hope... You've all had a fabulous time. Uh, thank you so much for travelling to, for many people, a very, very long way away. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed your time in Hobart and in Australia. Um, I hope you've been able to get out and enjoy some of um, the natural riches that Hobart has to offer. Uh, don't forget to upload your um, remaining iNaturalist records. I know Arthur's are all sitting on, still on his phone or on his ca camera yet to go on online. Uh, so... See if you can beat Arthur to it. Um, very safe travels and hopefully we'll see you in Okinawa next year. And in the meantime, we'll catch you online. There is a, a, channel, a new channel created in the Slack channel for the conference for photos. If anyone has photos that they would like to share, uh, please put them up. Please make sure to put a Creative Commons licence up so that we know what we can do with those photos. And uh, um, uh, we can keep reliving the memories through that. Thank you all so much and safe travels. Up. <laughs>